go over primitive navigation real quick. So the first thing you need to know is the mnemonic never eat sour watermelon. What that allows you to do is if you know one general direction, you can find all other general directions. So we're going to focus on that first. But we can also use sundial navigation, so using the shadow moving across the ground to get a east to west line. And nighttime navigation, we can north star, we can use that, uh, or the waning or waxing crescent moon. Um, I often have my classes do a blindfold test, and that gives them an idea of how easy it is to travel in circles. We'll talk a little bit about that when we go into um, finding a bearing and why breadcrumbing and blazing and step counters are all important on trying to make sure that you're traveling in a straight line, but also kind of get a, give you an estimate of how far you've traveled. So... Um, streams and rivers are also important when traveling but they don't always go directly north and south in fact they very rarely go exactly north and south so we've got to talk about the flow of the water the direction it's going and how you can use it to travel but you can't use it to find a definitive direction so, never eat sour water, watermelon. Imagine a clock, an analog clock with hands, and the 12 o'clock position being north. So if you go 90 degrees from north, going clockwise, that's going to be east. And then if you go 90 degrees from east, going clockwise, you can find south. And then 90 degrees from south, going clockwise is west so here's a good visual so you know if, if I only knew north or any one of these directions I can find all the other general directions by kinda of laying this out on the ground so I could lay down some sticks that's a good way to kinda of visualize this so one stick would go north and south so I know north and then I would go 90 degrees from that to find east and that if I'm laying sticks across like in a cross formation that would easily find west for me so that that's how I do it once I know one general direction if I'm not just trying to visually imagine it in my mind but I want to see it on the ground I'll take two sticks and form a cross and I'll lay one in the north-south position if I knew north I would point the top of it towards north and I would lay the other one across at 90 degrees and that would give me north, east, south, and west. So I'd lay the first one down and then lay the other one across it just so I could visualize it. So how do we find a general direction if we don't know any of them? Well, if it's a bright sunny day, even if it's cloudy, and as long as you're having breaks in the clouds, you can use the sun to navigate so the easiest method is sun's gonna rise in the east it's gonna set in the west you know if it's early in the morning you can use that so now you know east if it rose you get a general direction there lining your stick up with where the sun rises or if it's setting in the west lining the stick up with west but let's say it's midday and you can't really get a good estimate then you can Take a stick, you put it in the ground, you need one that's about three feet high, ideally. Straight stick, it needs to be straight on a flat ground. So you may have to level off ground so that the shadow of the stick as the sun moves from east to west, that shadow is going to go from west to east. It's going to go in the opposite direction. So the first point, the very tip of that shadow, of that stick, you measure with a stick in the ground or a rock, but it needs to be the end of the stick, end of the shadow. And then every 15 minutes, mark it. The more points you measure, the more accurate the direction of travel is. And so once you do that, 
let's say it's been an hour and I've got four points on the ground. Now I have a west to east line or an east to west line, however you want to look at it. The shadow travels going from west to east because the sun rises in the east and then sets in the west. So the shadow actually moves the opposite direction. And that gives me an east to west line. It's a rough estimate. It's not perfect, but often the sundials that I've set up, if I take multiple points and maybe do this over a two hour time span, as long as the surface is really flat and the stick is three feet high and it's straight, I can set my compass up and that's a pretty good east to west line in most cases. It may be off by a few degrees, but at least you get a general direction of travel. So if you're trying to travel to the ocean or you know there's a river on one side, you know, to the west of you, but you just don't know where west is, this can help. It gives you general direction of travel, but obviously you have to have sunlight to do it. So here's a good visual of what I was talking about. Straight stick in the ground, flat ground. The first shadow you're going to see you're going to mark at the end of the shadow. That's going to be your westerly line. Then as this sun travels from east to west, this line shadow is going to travel from west to east. It's going to go in the opposite direction. So I would mark these points. Ideally, I'd like to have measured this out over an hour every 15 minutes. So I should have about four points on the ground. The last one that I mark is going to be my easterly point. So I could line a stick up with this or I could just visually draw a line in the ground. So now I know my general directions. So I know 90 degrees from east going clockwise is going to be south. 90 degrees from south going clockwise is going to be west. 90 degrees from west going clockwise is going to be north. So if you look at that, never eat sour watermelon. So I can use the mnemonic to kind of test it out and make sure everything lines up. It's pretty easy to do. And like I said, you don't have to have a completely clear day. It can be mildly cloudy as long as you get breaks in the clouds. As long as you can see a shadow on the ground, this will work for you. Now obviously, it's not always sunny. Sometimes you're out at night. But again, a lot of these involve being able to see the sky, being able to see the stars, being able to have a shadow either be on the ground or be able to see the stars or the moon to navigate. So this is not time navigation. So the two most common ways that I use is finding the North Star and then traveling from that. So the easiest way is to find the Big Dipper. It's going to make like a big scoop. The outer edge of the scoop, furthest away from the handle, you'll see two big stars. They'll form a line. And they'll point in the direction of the Little Dipper. The tail of the Little Dipper, I need to add that in. I didn't add that in. Is going to be Polaris. And that is going to be the North Star. I have this in other illustrations. So that's what the line is pointing to. It's the tail of the Little Dipper is the North Star. You can also use the crescent moon, waxing or waning. So waxing means that it's increasing in light. Waning means it's dying off from a full moon. But it needs to really be in that crescent phase. And you go from point to point on the crescent, drawing a line from those, those points on the crescent down to the horizon. And that'll give you a general direction of south. It's not perfect, but it's a quick reference. Something that you can easily set up and do quickly while you're trying to navigate at night, just if you didn't have a compass. So here's some visuals of that. I'll give you some better visuals in just a second. So we have the crescent moon, and we're just taking the points of that, and we're drawing a line that should 
towards the horizon. That'll give me an indication of south. Here's the Big Dipper. Here's the Little Dipper. Those are pretty easy to find. They're the easiest ones to pick up on if you're new to looking at stars and trying to navigate by um, the stars in the sky. But again, you have to have a visual of what's up there. If it's a cloudy night, it's not going to help you much. Unless there's breaks in the cloud, then this is easier to use than trying to find the Big Dipper and Little Dipper because you may have a cloud covering up one or the other. Anyway, here's your big scoop. So you have these two big stars form a line and they'll point to the handle of the Little Dipper at the end of that handle. And using this line will be the North Star. It's easier to find the Big Dipper than it is the Little Dipper for me. So here's a visual of that, a better representation of what you're doing. So here's the Big Dipper. You find it closer to the horizon. And then you take the outer edge, the two brightest stars, and the edge of the scoop or the dipper. And that'll point to the handle, the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. And then you go directly down to the ground. That'll be north. That's the direction that you're traveling. So you just take a straight line down from that handle. So here's a video on nighttime navigation. Now, let's talk a little bit about crescent moons. This is one that confuses a lot of people. They don't know what waxing or waning is. So waning is it's starting to decrease. So that's going to be the one on the left. It's gone from that full moon phase and it's kind of dying off. And then you have waxing where it's increasing in light. So it's building towards the full moon. Either way, if you see a crescent moon, go point to point and that should give you a general direction of south. Here's those moon phases. And this is what I'm talking about, the waxing crescent. So here on the waxing crescent, it's starting to build. So you notice we're building to a full moon. That's what I was talking about, where it increases in light over time. We really can't use these other phases. Uh, the best thing with the increasing amount of light is we can do a form of sundown navigation, navigation or moondown navigation as it gets brighter as long as you have um, a shadow being cast on the ground. Even at night, if the moon's bright enough, you can get it cast, a shadow cast on the ground and get a general idea of direction of travel. Still, it's a general idea. And then you also have the waning crescent. So this is the one that we were looking at before. If we go back to that other slide, that's what I was talking about. So we had um, waxing versus waning, and that'll give you an idea of how they're building. So moon dial, now obviously you're not going to use a crescent. Often it's not bright enough. You really need a full moon to do this. A better illustration would be having a full moon, and as it moves you can get an east to west line as well. Just It's the same principle as the sundial navigation. So if you're having trouble with that, go back to the sundial. And you still use that mnemonic, never eat sour watermelon once you get that east to west line. Again, these are rough estimates, right? They're, they're, they're not perfect. And there's going to be some measurement error, um, but we're talking a few degrees. We're talking primitive navigation, just trying to you know, walk in one general direction. So once you have that general direction, if it's an open area, it can be easy to select a bearing. So we need something to walk towards so we don't drift and start to walk in circles. And there's a couple different methods to prevent that. In open areas, you can find a big, huge point that's easily identifiable in the distance and you walk towards that because you know all right, that lines up with the direction I need to travel. I'm moving to that, and then I'll reset once I get to it and make sure I'm still on my direction of travel. So something large in, in the distance. Um, an example that I gave you was selecting a bearing. So I've got my sundial here. I know the direction I need to travel. Let's say I need to go south. I know this mountain range, this big peak is in the direction I need to go and so I start traveling towards it and once I get to that point then I can check my bearings again I may have to set up another sundial 
and check to see if I'm still traveling in that general direction. And I find another point and I start walking to it. Now that can be difficult when you're in a forest. You may not be able to see the horizon. There's two main techniques. The most common one used by most people is blazing a tree. And that's where you cut the side of the tree. A lot of people will say cut the piece of bark completely off because it may curl back up and seal up and then you can't see where you blazed at and you may walk past it if you're trying to retrace your steps. But breadcrumbing for me is the easiest way to line up my path and it works best for more varieties of dense bush. So if I'm having to crawl through stuff I can line up stones behind me and I put a video in this and then I can line those up as long as they continue to be in a straight line I know I'm traveling fairly straight now you may have some drift but not as bad as if you tried to do this on your own so you keep trying to walk go in a straight line but often with breadcrumbing you have to turn around and line up your breadcrumbs these can be rocks or sticks in the ground you have to line them up and make sure that they're forming a straight line if you start to see one drift out from the other that's telling you that you're starting to go in a circle very hard to do that when you're blazing a tree the best thing blazing a tree can do for you is it functions almost the same way as breadcrumbing if somebody's trying to find you they can follow the trail that you blazed but it also damages the trees and sometimes you're having to crawl through stuff and you're low on the ground and breadcrumbing even works then. You just need line of sight to keep everything lined up. I try to always have three breadcrumbs, three rocks or three sticks lined up always in sight. And then if somebody's trying to rescue you, they can come in and follow those. Or if you get lost and decide, oh, I've gone in the wrong direction, you can move back and go back in a general direction. So here's an idea of what you've done. You've taken a machete, you've chopped the bark off so that you can see the cambium layer underneath. It needs to be seen from a long ways away. It needs to be on the side of the tree. So that way you know which direction you're going. They're not always facing you. And that way somebody trying to follow you will kind of get an idea. And you can even kind of line those up if the bark Kind of, if it hangs off but like I said a lot of experts say not to leave the bark hanging to chop it completely off because sometimes it'll curl up and stick back to the tree so here's a video on blazing trees here's a video on breadcrumbing it'll give you a better idea of what I was talking about now before we move on to rivers and streams I want to talk a little bit about step counters so these can be beads on a string can be some sort of or just putting pebbles in your hand if you didn't have that and so you need to have an idea of how far you travel based on how many steps some people say 10 steps and then they turn a bead some people say 20 it's just it's it's a rough estimate there's a lot of different methods the idea is it helps you remember how far you've gone so um, every bead let's say that I've traveled you know 25 feet then I know with four beads that's going to indicate that I've gone a hundred feet and so once I have 12 of those then I know I've gone roughly a hundred yards you know it's just an indication and and then a hundred yards is giving me an indication of you know I can get a an estimate of how far I've traveled right I can start to add all of those up and give me a rough idea how many miles have I traveled today and I can do that based on those bead counts or stones in the hand some people like to go a full hundred yards before they move a bead and they have an idea based on full strides how many steps that would take them so they count out their steps and they're like okay there's a hundred yards so just depends on how far you're traveling on how far you want to spread that out all right, so now let's talk about rivers and streams. Now, rivers and streams are a good way to travel through dense bush fast if you have some sort of flotation device or the water's not going to make you hypothermic or you can swim, all right? It was, there's a bunch of key factors going into this or even the conditions of the water, right? You may have all, met all those conditions, but the water's just unsafe. But it's a lot easier to travel along a shoreline 
as long as the banks aren't too steep and the water flow is not too dangerous, sometimes you can just use water to travel. The water flow will often move much faster than you can travel. Or maybe the water's not flowing at all and it's giving you a path through a dense forest, mountains, what have you. But you get the idea. It's a lot easier to travel than to bushwhack through dense undergrowth. In the northern hemisphere, the flow of the water is going from north to south. That does not mean it's always traveling from north to south, right? Like if you look at the flow of water, you're like, oh, okay, I know this goes from north to south. No, sometimes because of all the water, because of gravity, right? The water is going to turn and go back north for a period of time, or it could be going northwest, northeast, whatever. It The rivers twist and turn, so they don't always go directly north and south. And in the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. But the good thing about rivers, an easy path to navigate through dense bush. It can go, often the flow of water is going to go much faster, even in open areas, much faster than you can walk. So if you have a way to make a raft, or if you just want to swim, as long as the water is warm enough, and you're not going to get chilled during the night, you can often move faster with the river flow, or at least along the bank, if there's dense undergrowth. But I wanted to pull up these rivers. I've traveled many of these, like the Colorado, the Brazos, the Trinity. All of these I've done trips on, the Oasis River. And what you'll notice by looking at this map, look, at certain times, you're traveling back north. There are times where you're headed from west to east. But it gives you an idea. There are times where you're headed from east to west. You know, they, you've got all these twists and turns, and this really doesn't give you a good representation. If I were to zoom in on Google Maps on the Brazos River, you're going to see some crazy turns in it as you go through. So I've done the area of the Brazos from Waco all the way down to Richmond. And that took about let's see the first part of it was four days the last part we did six so you're looking at a total of ten days to go that far but if I were to try to walk it no way just no way especially once you get into the Houston area with the dense piney woods you're not gonna move that fast so it was much faster there were times because the river was actually flooded when we were on it where we were tra traveling at seven miles an hour because I had my GPS with me so that gives you an idea. Now, it wasn't safe to be on it during that time, but it was moving quick because we had had flooding the week before, and so there was still a lot of flow. But the moral of the story here, you're not always going from north to south because of gravity. These rivers move and twist and turn. Look at the Red River up here along the border. Look at the Rio Grande in the directions that it travels. That gives you a really good idea of how you can't use them to determine direction by looking at the flow of water. But most of them lead to larger civilizations. Most people want to live along those rivers because they can fish and eat, especially in a primitive setting. So they're going to lead somewhere. It'll be much faster. Um, movement of water plus you can fish and hunt along the banks edible plants are going to be along those banks as well especially going through desert areas it'll be a source of water for you it'll be a source of food a lot of the edible plants will grow along that and then here's a video talking about that <laughs>